Um, it's about the five after, so we'll go ahead and start, and then Mindy can, can catch up if she's doing okay. Um, all right, so I think the first thing, Barbara, I, I would I call the meeting to order, and I uh, just want to say thanks to everybody for the time before this and tonight and in the future. We, we appreciate the effort and, and all the brain power uh, around the Clayton plan. And Barbara, uh, thanks to you for taking the notes, and I think uh, we should go ahead and call the roll. I'm sorry. Can nobody hear me? Yeah, we're having trouble. I at least I'm having trouble hearing you. Nothing at all. Here we go. Uh, that's better. Yep. Work through for today. <laughs> Steven? Here. Bachman? Yep. Alice is going to be late. Uh, Ms. Williams? Yes. Craddock? <laughs> He's here, but not back yet. Uh, Muncie? Derek was on tonight. I see Derek on. Yeah. Here. And Foley. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to approval uh, for the minutes of the previous meeting for the February 10, 2021 meeting. Um, does anybody have any changes that they would want to make to those before we request a motion to approve? Okay. Uh, oh. Hearing, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'll move for approval. Seeing no uh, no changes. Thanks, Brendan. Do we hear a second? I'll second. Okay, Mike. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. All opposed. All right. Motion carried. Okay, so let's move into the new business. Um, uh, let's see here. Can you move down, Seth? Yeah. Okay, there you go. That's that's good. Okay. Um, so I think the first, um, so everybody uh, did a good job of, of getting this information up on the spreadsheet. We appreciate that. I think the first, uh, the first committee that we're going to look at is just, in, we'll look at maybe a, just an overview of, of where you are with that, the, the Walkable Neighborhoods Committee with, uh, with uh, Derek and Mindy. And Derek, it might be you because Mindy may, uh, may not be back. I can't see. Yeah, she's not back. That looks like it's the case. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here, pulling everything up. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, the, I guess our, uh, the way we ranked everything um, kind of went over uh, last time where it's the most visible, impacts the most number of people. And then um, cost effective too. Um, one one thing we thought was pretty low hanging fruit cost wise and visibility uh, wise and, and and affecting the most people was just completing the sidewalks on Main Street. And um, we, we looked through a few potential funding sources. Um, one that has come up since our meeting was. Um, maybe a partnership with the RTA. Uh, one of my partners at the firm uh, worked close with the RTA. So I ran the idea by him, uh, you know, and asked him if, if there would be any uh, opportunity to connect uh, bus stops that might not be connected with sidewalks or connect communities with sidewalks to bus stops. And there are certainly funds available to uh, at least build bus stops, at least create infrastructure for bus stops, which might be a way to uh, connect some of uh, those sidewalks on Main Street that might not be uh, at the moment. Um, and then the uh, another one that was kind of similar would be a Summer Suite to Old Salem. It's, it's a little bit smaller project than our uh, desired Main Street project, you know, from the Taywood to Main Street project that that's still on our list, but uh, step you know might be a little more uh, uh, doable, especially seeing as how I, th I think this summer they're going to start some work on that intersection, um, and, and then uh, you know obviously our, our Main Street 
goal is still on the list just because we think it's a, a pretty big uh, project. And then uh, National Road, um, that's whole area. We took one of our projects off the list. Uh, since the apartment complex fell off the uh, plan, you know, if that were up and ready to go, I think that would be a project that would be further up the list. But at the moment, you know, there's, there's not much out there. And, and we both agreed that sidewalks to nowhere at the moment would, would, shouldn't be a. You know, <laughs> That, that's, I would say that's uh, our condensed version of our meeting right there. Great. Hey, hey Derek, you talked about this a little bit last time, but like um, if somebody said, what's the biggest obstacle to that, you know, just that you, that you ran across, um, was it connectivity? Was it, was it lack of, uh, was it the road kind of pushed out to the property edges, like all of that stuff? Regarding. Regarding. Uh, regarding you know more walkable neighborhoods and more connectivity uh, I'm not entirely sure okay uh, you know I know our, our the way we ranked our projects were you know what's going to impact the most number of people and me yep. then cost and um, I, Mindy I think has the the notes a little bit better she might be able to tell you our, our ranking list better. I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but um, those were our two biggest concerns and visibility was another one. So we definitely prioritize projects that it, the, com the community will be able to see and at least maybe make it look like we did something. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Whether or not connecting two sidewalks that are, have three or four houses in between them on main street, uh, this is doing a lot and at least people will be able to see it. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want me to have, do you want me to read those notes that we had? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I, we kind of reprioritized. So number one was the main street sidewalks, complete the sidewalks to all the bus stops, you know, make sure it was a continuous um, sidewalk through uh, main street or down Main Street. And then our second one was um, Garber to Main on Old Salem. Um, then you would have Garber to Main to Old Salem all connected. And we sat on both sides of the street for that one. And then our third one was 49 to Summer Suite on both <clears throat> sides to Old Salem. Um, which would um, kind of connect Hunter's Glen, Summer Suite, and Valley Brook together. Number four was Old Salem, Taywood to Maine, sidewalks, one side, uh, because as we talked about in the last meeting, um, the other side is kind of a, an issue with uh, properties being too close to the road. So we weren't sure that that would even fly. And then um, the last one we have is um, the um, allotment past the high school called Spring Hill, um, a sidewalk connecting it on a national road because national road has a sidewalk all the way down, but not to Spring Hill. So that was our number five. And then um, we also had a question. Um, it's on ours. Uh, on our goals, but it's on also on um, Main Street goals that um, the demo and code enforcement for um, uh, buildings or things that are uh, vacant, those kinds of things, um, whose objective is that? Is that um, Derek and I, or is that uh, go with the Main Street people? Just Central Core. Seth, Seth Dorman, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it ties into a lot of what um, I mean, Derek and Mindy and, and, uh, and Kim and Brenda will be talking about, um, and, and really Mike and I with, with Great Streets, um, specific to Main Street, but, you know, some of that demo of, of derelict properties, you know, might lend itself to the assemblage of property that that in the future would be needed to kind of do 
the, the, the vision for Main Street. You know, and, and to remind you all of the vision for Main Street um, at some point in the future uh, would be potentially to create a traditional downtown where you've got a couple story buildings with commercial on the floor, ground floor, maybe office and residential above. You've got parking on Main Street. Of course, you'd have to slow the speeds down on Main Street. Um, but really to try to create an area where people will gather. Um, as a community and, and, and part of that is you know getting connectivity there you know, getting sidewalks there so people can get there without you know without having to drive their car down and park um so i think i think that objective kind of ties into a lot of what what at least three of us are talking about three of our groups are talking about but um you know it's something that the city remains diligent on and uh, when opportunities arise to look at property, available property, we do, um, you know, when, when buildings become derelict and, and need to be taken down, we have a process for that. Um, and and, and Daryl Swafford, our code enforcement officer, I think does a great job with um, citing folks that, you know, are not maintaining their properties. So does that answer your question, Mindy? Yeah, we were just, you know, that's one of our objectives in the plan is mm -hmm. to, um, you know, get rid of the dead wood, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, so it opens up possibilities for other, um, you know, people to maybe come in and build or whatever, yeah. you know. And so we thought that might be something um, mm -hmm. that would be one of our, that would be our number five. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's an ongoing process um, that will ultimately help, you know, kind of help the city realize the vision down there. Okay. Did that help, Derek? Did I give it everything? I, I did want to add a couple of things. Um, okay. One idea we had, you know, I, I know we had this big uh, connect uh, all of old Salem, the main street project. But even if we cut it in half kind of in that Garber from Garber to old Salem would connect a lot of people because uh, Garber has some sidewalk down it. And um, you know, you can get to the bus stop at the end of Garber or you can head down Garber if you live in that neighborhood that touches the uh, Garber sidewalk. Um, and then if we were able to complete that, we would have some framework looking back down the street to uh, maybe build off of, uh, it, it might make some of those property owners uh, a little more or less excited to see uh, what it would actually look like or what type of infrastructure uh, we would need to uh, actually complete that project. At worst case scenario, we, we connect a sidewalk to Main Street that's already there uh, from Garber. Um, and then uh, uh, I found our ranking list. Um, we put value uh, to the most number of people in the community is number one. That's kind of, a, that was our number one point. And then projects we thought were urgent or at least seemed urgent. And uh, then availability of outside funding. So, uh, you know, if we're, like if we're able to get some funding either through RTA or some of our other uh, political sources, then uh, uh, that would take priority over something that, that we couldn't. Um, and then time to complete and the total cost rounded out our, our ranking list. So if you're curious, that's what we use to determine what projects we liked and didn't. And along with um, time to complete, we had like time to complete slash perception for what Derek said before does it look like we're doing something to improve Clayton and you know, how quickly can we get some of these things done so that it, the perception is there that um, we're moving forward. So. I have a comment um, or a question. Um, I live on Garber, but I live on the um, in closer to Westbrook. Um, and so right where I am, there are no sidewalks there. 
but very close to the street, there's the drains and everything. And I know on um, on uh, Old Salem, they have like the drains right there close to the street. So that was, I was just wondering about how, if we added sidewalks, how would that part be taken care of or, or where would the sidewalks go? <laughs> yeah, the drains, yeah. yeah. That sounds like a question for an engineer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the whole, you know, Derek and I did talk, you know, the whole um, thing from Main Street, Garber, Tay, with that whole area, I think, is an engineering question. I mean, is it possible even to do right. that? Right, right. That was my question. Is it possible with the drains right there? Some of them have, like, the, um, the little ditches. Right. So... And some of the houses are literally, you know, six feet from the from the road on the one side. So mm. I'm thinking that side's probably not going to work. But we thought maybe at least one sidewalk on one side was our thought. I know, at least from Willow Creek Drive to uh, Old Salem has a sidewalk on the uh, what seems to be the more residential side all the way mm. down. Um, and then that, that whole neighborhood right there would then have access to Main Street, uh, a, a walkable route to Main Street, if we were just to connect uh, um, Old Salem to, to Main. And that's just a little stretch there. I don't, I don't know where the pushback is on that from property owners. You know, I don't know if that's the Garber to Main section of Old Salem would be uh, – an issue, but it could be a potential starting point, and it's a, a lot smaller, manageable project compared to Taywood to Main Street. Yeah. yeah, because on the other side, you have all of those houses, or the majority of those houses have pretty nice front yards. So, <laughs> yep. lots of land in the front. Yeah, never want to take away the nice yard. <laughs> yeah, to put a sidewalk on it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, we're, we're going to hear a lot more, I think, next week. I've invited um, City Manager Amanda Zimmerlin, uh, Public Service Director Randy Sanders, Finance Director Kevin Schweitzer, and, and our Development Director Jack Coons to, uh, to, to kind of have a roundtable discussion with our group, just to kind of look at our list of projects and to talk realistically about um, potential costs, you know, potential... Um, you know, sort of what's involved in, in the types of projects that we're, we're presenting, or at least that we've so far come up with. Um, so I think that'll be a very useful discussion, but in terms of putting sidewalks in front of houses and in drains and things like that, we, as a city, may need to acquire some right-of-way. Um, obviously, our plans will have to be engineered, and uh, if you're putting in sidewalk, you may have to relocate some of those drains and uh, for, for storm water and, and that sort of thing. And uh, you may end up putting curb and gutter in with, with catch basins. And then, um, you know, I could see where you'd want the separation between the vehicles and the pedestrians. So you probably have a grass strip and then sidewalk. So, um, you, you know, the, the, those projects I think are critical. Um, they're, they're also expensive. Uh, and, 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 and a lot to consider as, as we move forward. But we'll hear more about that next week as well. So yeah, I think it would be huge to hear from those people. I mean, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, I think it's important and critical for us to be able to put a five-year plan together that, that actually makes sense. And, it's and doable. You know, projects that we can do. Yeah, right. exactly. It's doable. So. <laughs> you know, I got uh, just one more question. Quick comment. I don't want to go through a big discussion on this because it's kind of a, a topic of its own, but I think it goes along with the walkable neighborhoods and actually some other stuff too, connected parks and great streets. Like we're talking about um, if we do have to widen some of these areas, you know, for less, let's say we're going to put sidewalks in somewhere. Yeah, I think it's also the time, you know, you want to do it all at one time if we're going to do any bike lanes. Mm -hmm. Because that would be, um, you know, as big as our city is, you know, you're probably not going to walk from one end to the other, but you certainly might bike. So I, th I just think that needs to be 
You know, I don't want that to be an afterthought. Well, we should have put a bike lane in there too. While you're so, doing it, you might as well do the book. Yeah. I think you kind of have to, if you're going to do it ever, you kind of have to do it all at the same time from a money standpoint. Right. So. And, and to, to, to dovetail on that, Mike, I would say that, you know, if it comes down to one side or the other, um, you know, I would want the bike path or the multi-use trail uh, standard instead of a sidewalk because it, you can use it in so many different ways. And, in um, you know, if we can connect bicycle traffic throughout the city, ultimately, I think that's an important goal. So that would be my suggestion. Um, can, can you use bicycle? You, I mean, I don't know why you couldn't walk on a bike path. You can. That, okay. Yeah. Okay, I thought that was like something there that, you know, you weren't supposed to be walking. Well, no, and, and, and we, uh, we just recently put together some standard construction drawings. I, I work with Randy Sanders on that. Um, I think we, we had that loosely, but we've now got a, a standard set. So when a developer comes in or the city's working on a project, we can refer to those standards. And what we've put in there um, for, for a multi-use path or a, a bike path, whatever you want to call it, is a, a basically a 10-foot wide path standard. And what that gives you is it gives you two essentially two five foot wide lanes, if you want to call it that. Uh, for, and it makes two way traffic when you've got the mixture of uh, bicyclists and pedestrians, it, it makes it a lot safer and um, it flows so much better. So a 10 foot standard is kind of what I, I envision and, and what we're going to try to do moving forward. Okay. Hey, uh, Seth, um is is it your is it your thought that like any like is it the you know somebody had mentioned earlier potential state funding for this stuff is are all of these state funds and federal funds that could be possible do they all prioritize adding pedestrian access or more and more is it, I mean is that is that more of a trend I think you see that I think um, in 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 really even uh, kind of a prerequisite to even applying for some of the grants is you have to have accessibility and, and that sort of thing on, um, you know, crossings and sidewalks. So, um, but yeah, I, th I think, I think it helps because it provides an, al an alternate alternative transportation mode and, and that, that tends to get you more points. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, Mindy and Derek, thanks. Thanks for the work on that. Um, um, I, I will say, I, you said this the last time too, Derek, I think, and I, you, repeat, you really kind of reiterated tonight, just the idea that um, wherever they go to try to prioritize the areas that it can impact the most people. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's something that I think makes a lot of sense to me anyway. So, so good. Um, all right, can we move on to the second one? Sure. Okay, Kim and uh, Brendan, uh, the Central Cores. Well, our, uh, ours will be, uh, Kim and myself, probably be a little short and sweet. Um, so actually, uh, before her and I met to kind of just go over, you know, we cleaned up uh, the Central Cores map. Um, the two of us, along with Mayor Stevens and Seth, met, and we kind of had the idea of a lot that we were saying, especially what was kind of our higher priority early uh, stuff that could be done earlier, really, matched up so we said hey let's the four of us meet uh so i think um you know a lot's going to be said during their time uh here but uh we'll just go over the the cleaned up map here real quick um and again you know if you recall from our last meeting you know we had kind of identified everything that was marked on the original center core map which you know you can still see is on here uh and there was multiple ones that you know were marked as really would determine more was a, a city entrance, not really a, a true core of, of anything. Uh, it's just kind of an entrance to the city, not much to potential for development or anything currently there. Uh, so we kind of broke it down into these five uh, that, you know, still just kind of the basic uh, head, headings for them, Main Street, Government Center, the Historic Center, um, the Hoke Business uh, uh, center right right along uh, 70 on Hope, and then kind of that North Mon, North Clayton. 
Um, you know, again, this isn't set in stone, but uh, I think it, it just kind of gives breaks it down into what are the true central cores currently and, and probably the most hope for, for, you know, the next 10, 20 years of, of much getting developed. Uh, Kim, I don't know if you had anything to add to, no, to that or job. anything else we discussed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know if uh, Kim and myself really have much more on that, especially since, uh, and, you know, Mike and Seth, when it gets to you guys, feel, feel free to, you know, if you want us to chime in on anything that the four of us discussed, but, um, but the four of us had a great meeting a couple weeks ago and went over a lot. Hey, Brendan, is the, of the five, of the five, you guys did a nice job on this, uh, um, of the five, is the, is the government center, would that be considered a core, I mean, is there, are there places to grow around there? No, and that was actually, if you recall the last meeting, when we kind of broke down each section and, uh, and gave characteristics of it. The government center was kind of a question of, well, is this a really a core? Uh, I think it's still because it is the government center and there is, it is considered a gathering place. Um, a couple events are, are held there. Um, if there wasn't the government center there, I'd probably say no, but I think it's still just because it has that there. But yeah, all, around there, obviously that's right on the edge of the city. Um, uh, in that area, there's not really much room for for any kind of development from a really much more of a residential or any kind of commercial. Uh, but I think it's just still to kind of, for a city to identify them. I mean, it, you know, different than say, our neighborhood where theirs is in their city center and there's a, and I've said currently the library there and a, a lot of other things uh, that, that we don't have in that set. So good to kind of identify that as a, a city core. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for, um, for Brennan and Kim or, um, and I know Mike and Mike and Seth will kind of weigh in on this too. I'll throw one one thought out about uh, the Main Street corridor. I um I, I talked to Mike about this a few weeks ago. And this is my own my own opinion, and maybe it's not something that people would agree with. But um, I think a lot of communities would be envious to have an existing uh, commerce strip like like 48 that Clayton has, because some communities just don't have that. And I you know ever since we've been working on this committee, I live close to it, so I drive down it all the time. But it just seems to me that there's so much opportunity for, um, for, a, for a plan there. And I'm talking about from Westbrook Road uh, north to, uh, uh, what's the northern border, Seth? Essentially where, where uh, Garber comes out, I think, is, is pretty close. Yeah. It just seems, yeah, it just seems to me that, um, and I know Brendan last time mentioned that, you know, the hard part is we don't, we, the, the city doesn't control every acre of property, but um, I, I just have a bit of an opinion that, um, that the city might be well served if we spent a little money on trying to, trying to, trying to carve out a plan for that section from Westbrook to Garber, and maybe it's been done. And I know this is not a new topic, but um, I, you know, in terms of like trying to draw income tax producing businesses that'll benefit the city and also having some, having some infill. Dan, Dan you freeze up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he's frozen hey, yeah. until he gets back. I, um, I wanna comment on that too. You know, the other thing about Maine, I, first of all, I agree with Dan 100%. There's a lot of potential there. But I'll tell you, the other really uh, strange thing is, um, I don't know the exact number because I haven't taken an inventory, but there are tons of um, parcels for sale down there right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the whole place is for sale. And it may be, you know, maybe it is a time where we can say, you know, we can start 
um, acquiring some of these places because the truth of the matter is, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, talk bad about someone's property, but there's a lot of those properties that just need, really do need to be bulldozed. Mm -hmm. And see, that's um, what we were talking about too, and putting the sidewalks in there and you'd get more people in there, maybe more foot traffic. Yeah. I don't know. That, that seems to be our top priority as well. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, a, you know, some of those places are just, you know, really old. They're out of place. They're, they're never going to fit a great street, let alone a main street. And, you know, until we can either buy them, you know, or get them, you know, through, you know, some of these countywide programs um, that they have out there, it, it's going to be, it's going to be tough because um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I think most of you know, uh, I'm throwing, I, I don't think he would mind me saying this, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it, but I think most of you know Ted Gudorf. Okay, Ted owns a you know, pretty nice business down there. He's put a lot of money into his building down there. Well, when the, the property right next door to him sold, he was, he was upset about it because, first of all, he said, you know, he, he would like to have had a chance to buy it. And I, I kind of told him, I said, well, that's really, you know, I mean, that's really not any of our fault. You know, he tried to kind of, you know, put it that way. But what he was mad about was that it remains, you know, he's put a lot of money into his commercial business there and it's nice building and everything, but right next to it remains a residential house. And I think in his mind, you know, now we have to wait till these, this owner sells it, if they ever sell it, in order to you know, basically build another commercial building that not only would complement his, his personal building, because he has a personal stake here, but uh, Ted also, you know, is, is, uh, has a good vision. He's, you know, a former mayor of the city and uh, Ted, you know, had a vision. Now, some of it is, you know, came through, some of it didn't, but I think he's right on on this. Now we're going to be in, you know, now we have to wait until this owner decides to do something else, if he ever does. We could, we could grow all around it and, all, and still have, you know, a little clapboard residential house there. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things that we need to, um, you know, we need to be in touch with the Ted Gudorfs, the business owners, that when something comes up for sale if we know about it next to their business we can say hey you know this is something you ought to probably jump on i think he probably would have jumped on it at least he says he would okay so yeah. you're going to have to enlighten me the newbie to the city here <laughs> yeah i'm sorry it's down on main street okay it's, where it's, where on main i don't know how to tell you it's uh <laughs> it's sort of in the maybe a little bit north of the Stillwater property on the other, on the opposite side. Okay. He owns, um, he's, a, he's an attorney and he owns a, a law firm and there's an accounting firm in there and it's professional. It's a professional building. It's on the west side of the building. So, mm -hmm. but, but again, right. there's other, there's others down there that we've talked about for a long time. You know, the, um, the red barn down there, the Annie's attic or whatever it is, you know, th those are things that are, they're just not helping us. And I'm not, you know, I'm not here to bash the owner, you know, it's their property. They do what they want with it, but from a development side, it's just not helping us. Mm -hmm. Hey, Hey, Mike and group, I, I have, I guess, maybe a devil's advocate position to, to what Mike just said. I just, I want to get your take on it because I've heard that sentiment from Ted in a conversation I had with him, but I've also heard the sentiment from realtors in town who say we just don't have enough rooftops in Clayton. And I know of, I've had conversations with property owners on Maine who are selling kind of those old residential style houses or buildings to people that, that want to live on Main Street. In fact, there was one, uh, was a, a local restaurant owner, I think in, in, near near Randolph Plaza or in, in Randolph Plaza and they wanted to buy the house across the street so that they could live there and 
across the street and, and go to work. So, um, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Mike, and, and really what I understand what Ted's saying as well. I just, how, how do you, um, you know, kind of how do we rectify the other side of it, which is there are people that still want to live down there. It, it, and I'll say this, our new zoning code, um, although I think the vision is for multi-story buildings with residential on the second floor, um, our new zoning code, as it's written, and I know it hasn't been approved by by council yet, uh, Mike and, and Brendan, but um, you know it, it will allow for residential on Main Street. Any, I guess, any thoughts on that or? Well, well Seth, I, I, yeah, Seth, I was gonna, I mean, I and and I, I, I my internet must have dropped away or something because I made this great speech and I think everybody missed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. sure it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, but um, so, you know, I, I just, maybe it's not an either or equation. Maybe it could be housing. Maybe it could be retail. Maybe, it, and I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get what Mike said about, about what, what Ted's comments were, but it's, I guess, from a planning standpoint, wouldn't, isn't it okay that the city would say, hey, look, we think, we think there's a lot of property on this corridor that is not up to its highest and best use right now. We're not sure what that highest and best use is, but let's, as a city, really take this point A to point B from Westbrook Road up to Garber and just, and just kind of paint a vision for what that could be. And, and, and I, maybe I'm, I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth, but you know, maybe one property, what, it'll take 20 years for that property to ever be part of that vision. But maybe if you go to another property owner and you say, by the way, this is what we want this to become, um, maybe it helps them to kind of head in that direction. And I, you know, this stuff doesn't happen overnight, but I guess, I, I guess I'm curious, and I asked this before my, I probably popped out, but um, has there been a plan for that section that, or has there been a dedicated plan to really drive more density to those, to those properties that are infill property, you know, on Maine. I would say that it's definitely touched on on Plan Clayton. So it, mm -hmm. you know, it establishes the vision for Maine. I don't know that we've had a dedicated plan for Main Street. And I guess I'll circle back to kind of Mike's point. So mm -hmm. when we get the residential style, the older residential style buildings that are for sale and they're purchased by a new person who's gonna live there, um, you know, that may be 10, to 20 years before that comes back on the market, depending on how yeah. things work out for that person. And so, um, although, you know, I think it's great that people want to live on Main Street, um, to realize our vision, we do need to acquire properties when we can, um, because it's going to take an assemblage of quite a few. And, and part of that reason is because a lot of the, the parcels on Main don't have a lot of depth. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, or, or a lot of acreage. I mean, as you look at it that way. So it's just going to take a, a fair number of these properties in the same area, um, whether we control them or, or own them or what have you. And then talking to the property owners, if we don't own them and don't have control over them and, and express what that, what that vision is. And I, I mean, I think our zoning code does a pretty good job. We have design standards. We have our plan Clayton that we can refer to as well in terms of the vision. Um, it, it's, it's just gonna be a very time consuming um, to get to that vision and, and to get that vision to reality. And um, if I might hop in here when, um, and Mike, you probably know this also, as a real estate agent, when we talk to someone about listing their property, um, we don't necessarily check to see what the city has planned for that area. So it's, you know, it just doesn't even come to your mind to consider something like that. I guess um, if it's somehow widely publicized or, you know, gotten to the appropriate people that might help sell those properties that would be great but you know it's just not something that we do unless the homeowner says or or the um, property owner says hey the city has these plans 
um, we don't necessarily go digging for that kind of information. <laughs> So how can we get that word out to the, the Realtor Association in the area, yeah. you know what I mean? Right. Because that seems critical. I mean, we, mm -hmm. Jack, Jack and I just met with a, a gentleman who's trying to sell his property on Maine for his mom. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you know, he came in and met and, and we had an opportunity to kind of share what, what we're thinking, what we see for Main Street, you know, what the, what the plan calls for. But... Um, you know, how, how do we get the Realtor Association on board with that? Do you have any right. ideas? Well, go ahead, Mike. Well, just uh, two, two things. Um, again, uh, you know, we can talk forever on this stuff, but mm -hmm. two things. One, I, I think um, it's going to be unrealistic to expect the Realtors or the Realtor, you know, the Dayton Area Board to... Um, initiate anything like that because the quite frankly you know there it's all about selling the house and you, they don't really care to be honest about it i mean if and I, i'm the same way when i go out to you know list a house i don't you know i don't think about the city or the town that much i'm you know i'm trying to serve the individual client but i do think that it's the city i think it it it's, has to be initiated by us and I think we need to go out there and talk to that real estate agent or really the owner and say, yeah. Hey, you know, you know, take, take them out or take them out the plan. Sometimes, you know, it might be a time consuming thing, but you know, we need to see if we can make a deal with them to get this stuff. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's, I, I think it's up to us and not the yeah. other way around. And then um, just, it would be from the city notifying the property owner basically and try to keep it somehow top of their mind. Hey, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about selling or this is our plan, would you consider selling? That's right. Let us know. Of course, they're always, they're always going to want the top dollar versus yeah. they're going to want to pay the bottom dollar. So. Right. Cause it's, cause it's the city and they got deep pockets. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> well, one, one more thing I wanted to say on, on uh, uh, Seth's um, devil's advocate comment there. I get all that. And, and I'm actually, I, I think it's really a great idea to be able to live on Main Street. But if you think about it this way, you know, you showed me some artist renderings in, the, um, in there the other day of like some intersections and things mm -hmm. that were really nice and everything. Well, I'm pretty sure there's not going to ever be an artist rendering of our main street showing, you know, the three story buildings and everything like that. And then a little clapboard house stuck in the middle. You know, that's, that's not, that's not the vision. The, right. You know, people living on main street is it's in my vision too. You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, maybe the, you know, we talked about different stuff, brownstone type or, um, you know, a b apartment above or a house above, business below, things like that. But I think if you drive up and down Main Street, if you go into Englewood, you see the same thing. You know, they've got houses interspersed everywhere. So does Union. So does West Milton. You know, I mean, you go all up and down there. Mm -hmm. But I think if, we, if we're going to stick to our vision, we have to try to get rid of some of those old buildings and including houses, some are houses, some are commercial buildings, some are used for both um, to, to get our vision going. Because, it, you know, the more I think about it, and I'm, 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 I think a pretty positive person. I try to look at the positives, not the negatives, but I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're not looking at the 20 year plan. We're looking at the 50 year plan. Mm -hmm. and i'm thinking by then it'll be a new plan <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it just to me it's 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 begin the closer we look at this the further it stretches out and that's why i think we need to be a little just a little bit more aggressive on it you know we can't make people sell it but mm -hmm. we can definitely go out there and say hey you know this is what the plan is you know can you think we could work a deal maybe we yeah. can Probably we can't, but maybe we can. Who knows? So anyway, 
so maybe either the city gets control or purchases property or connects the right type of developer right. with the seller at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 you know, and, you know, just, just one more thing with that. Um, you know, uh, I, I only know enough about this to appear ignorant, but, you know, they have, we have this land bank. I was just going to really say that, Mike. Yeah. I don't know a lot about the land use. bank. But yeah. Yeah. So, I think that I think that needs to be. I think the land bank. You know, we need to be lock hands on this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And this could start with what, like Mike, you had mentioned. There's a lot. There's a lot of uh, properties for sale, um, and some of those, and even the ones maybe they don't have for sale sign. But we, you know, we know some of those distressed and deserted properties um, along there as well. I know we've dealt with one or two of them. Uh, you know, in our, in the last couple of years of council, I, I know that the building used to be like a, uh, kind of like a more, like a lawnmower repair place. It's right at, I forget the corner that's on, but I know someone was looking into that and then they discovered, well, a prior occupant might not have been disposing of some chemicals uh, in the right way. And no, so then no. that, you know, um, so kind of created that issue, but yeah, that might, that might be kind of that low hanging fruit of, you know, what's the deserted what's the properties what's the ones that are for sale that maybe are, are lower price you mentioned the land bank so um but yeah i i know there is a section in playing clayton about about main street um you know kim and myself really didn't dive deep into that um looking at just you know identifying what the cores are but you can look at we kind of connected a lot of what was in the the original plan here of, of the central cores of a multiple what's marked as existing and proposed cores and that was just so all over the place we decided like hey you know most of main most of the of main street of what we have would be considered a core i mean almost you know pretty much uh from you know up around uh old salem down to you know al almost close to down to to the uh to the intersection of westbrook where it ends you know just kind of that a good chunk of that middle section um with uh you know you do have some open land there um you know waller in front of wallery at that intersection um in front of stillwater i know that's that property there there's some you know potential uh with that as well because i believe stillwater said you know we wouldn't mind if something went in front of there um so so yeah looking at that as a core um but i, I definitely dan I, I definitely agree with you and saying a lot of cities will be jealous of kind of a main street that we have and uh, let's see what we can do to utilize it. That's yeah, good. Yeah, you know, I had a friend who bought a house, one of those little houses south of Garber and north of Old Salem. Um, and he, and he, he bought it because he realized well, he, his, he thought he could rent it out to somebody who worked at Good Sam North and he did. He did it for a couple of years and he, he ended up selling it. Um, um, but but you know, when, you, when you think about, you know, when you think about retail or housing it really could end up being both um anyway anyway so yeah well good well you All guys right. did a good job hey brendan can i ask you too and kim um on the on the hope business we touched on this last time when you is that number four where what's around yes like, what's around there again is that is that the caterpillar facility uh, i mean the, no that would be more well um, no, that, that'd be, I mean, right now uh, that would almost be right around where, uh, Hoke and, and the 70, uh, exit are, or mm -hmm. is, uh, so obviously now Walmart isn't tech, isn't technically in Clayton, but you have Goodwill, uh, in there oh, okay. and, yep, yep. <clears throat> you know, we, and we, yeah, and, and, and we've dealt with that, you know, right now the people who live on Hoke road, you know, a lot of them are pretty much just, you know, waiting for, you know, someone big to come in, which happened to, it was two or three properties that the Goodwill came in. And uh, I remember when we were rezoning it, the property owners were at the meeting, just going like, Oh, we got a big check coming. So don't, so <laughs> <laughs> please approve this. Um, so uh, uh, property owners in that area, they, they, they pretty much, they know what's coming with, with when, being close to the highway and Walmart coming in. So um, it's kind of seeing, you know, what, what's looking to come in there. 
Um, but that's definitely being right by the highway. Uh, obviously, Walmart and everything around it is, even though that's Inglewood, is still, you know, there you're talking, that's a, um, um, uh, not a center, um, I forget the word, uh, but, you know, something that, that is um, that is a core to bring a lot of businesses and things as well. So, yeah. okay. uh, so that's basically, you know, what we designated that as. Because I know Mike had mentioned the last time, but maybe, you know, including in what is that Northmont one kind of down to Hoke and, you know, we discussed that and then it's like, well, it almost is kind of its own one as well. Because there is a, a strip of some residential in, in there as well, more, more open country areas, but there's still some residential and farm that will probably remain that. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Well, good. Anybody have any other questions for uh, for Kim and Brendan around this? I think Brendan said Mike and Seth might kind of touch on this too. And there's mm -hmm. um, a lot. Of, a lot of what we discussed was the uh, a lot of like the signage furniture that that will step that the four of us mainly talked about. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, Dan. Do you do you want us to go ahead of of uh, yeah your presentation? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and we, you know, we we uh, we did have a combined meeting, um, in, in kind of in the um, central core area. We put um, a street furnishings program, and, and along with that is is creating a standards book for that. So that would be things like trash cans, benches, uh, ash urns. We talked about do dog litter stations, things like that. Um, a directional and district signage program for central cores. Um, so just again, creating, we, we have a, a sign making machine now. And, and so, you know, we think that um, we can do a lot of that and, and, and that could be fairly low hanging just because we can do a lot of that in house, but um, creating a standard sign package for, um, you know, signage when we're, setting up the districts on Main Street or the Old Village um, and really throughout the city uh, just to have continuity in our signage. Um, uh, standards book for that as well and so that as developments come in or the city do, does projects you know we, we, we can refer to that book um, and we know what it should look like, what size it'll be, what color and all of that. Um, we uh, talked about a uh, primary road speed study. So just kind of looking at the existing roads we have there, are, we, we recognize this, um, we're creating areas where people can gather and, and uh, be together in community that some of the speeds like on National Road, like on Main Street are probably too, too high for uh, people to safely gather and and recreate together. So um, just looking at that and, and where we can reduce speeds uh, either by the speed limit itself or, or maybe there'll be some structural things that you can put in in terms of um, you know, possibly roundabouts or um, crosswalk signals or uh, and I'm just thinking about you know, uh, mid block humps or things like that, just things that can traffic calm. So that, that could come out of the speed study as well. Um, crosswalk improvement program, looking at critical intersections where we need crosswalks. Um, maybe you get the, uh, the ped signals and that sort of thing. Um, kind of moving down to, my, uh, to the list for great streets where we, uh, Mike and I have talked a lot about the sidewalk infill program, and I know that was touched on with um, uh, some of the other groups as well, uh, but just finding areas where the sidewalks are not complete um, and filling in those mis missing sections, we feel like that could be a low hanging fruit. Uh, looking at street lighting program for primary roads, street lighting program for residential streets, and preparing standards for that as well. So when we're on Main Street or National and we're putting in street lights, what, what, what will they look like um, when we're in a, a new residential development or we're infilling uh, lights in existing plats? What does that look like? Because it'll be a smaller scale. Um, I, we, we've also got gateway program. So 
as you look at our city entries, and this is, uh, a, I think, a core topic as well, but um, as you're coming into the city, where, where can we highlight, uh, what entries can we highlight with a structure or a sign or something that just draws attention to the fact that you're in Clayton? Um, possibly the same thing for city facilities, and, and we talked a lot about Meadowbrook and, and the, uh, the idea of improving the entrance to Meadowbrook and improving its identity. Um, we're going to be doing, uh, the city's going to be doing a project at 49 and Westbrook. Is that an opportunity um, to, to kind of draw, draw more attention to, to Meadowbrook and, and maybe work on the, the entrance a little bit as part of that? Um, one thing we don't have, we've been relying on the county for a long time as a thoroughfare plan, but do a city of Clayton thoroughfare plan so that we know uh, when developments come in, this road needs X number of feet of, of right of way. This is what we have. And so we can request right of way along the frontage for a development. Um, just so slowly but surely, you know, we can get the, the amount of right of way that we need for future improvements to the road, for so sidewalks, for <clears throat> lighting, for, uh, um, you know, green strips to kind of separate pedestrians from vehicular traffic. Um, Access management plan, I think that's gonna be especially critical on 49 as, as, as we see more and more truck traffic on 49. Um, right now, if I'm, a, if I'm a single family resident on 49, I can get direct access to Route 49 and, and um, you know, just kind of looking at where, where can we limit the access because of um, not wanting to slow traffic down or, or create uh, impediments to, to the flow of traffic um, you know, as the trucks are trying to get to 70 um, to Route 70 or to um, you know, to areas further south. <clears throat> and then green infrastructure study. So a lot of a lot of what Mike and I have keyed in on. I mean, we've definitely got some things that we can do physically um, early on, but uh, also just kind of doing a lot more studies uh, to kind of supplement Plan Clayton. Green infrastructure is another study. And, and these are things that actually were in the plan and we've kind of drawn out as um, studies that we can do up front and, and, and really be ready for uh, the future growth that we know, we, we know is coming. So um, we've also looked at some of the potential funding sources in VRPC in the state. Department of Devel Development has uh, great websites in terms of potential uh, so for the green um, infrastructure study, some alternative stormwater infrastructure loan program, um, I've looked at CDBG, and I know that's something that Jack has is, is applied for and we, I think we've used before, um, just seeing if whether or not anything that we're doing kind of ties into that would be, would qualify for that. Um, this one in, in, in this, I found kind of for our sidewalk infill program, ODOT has a safe routes to school program. Uh, you can get up to $400,000 for operational and physical improvements within two miles of a school, establish safer, connected and accessible crossings, walkways and bike facilities and trails um, if you're within two miles of the school. So that might be something we can use to, you know, to fill in some of these gaps. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's what we've come up with so far. I think we'll We'll all have a little better idea of, of um, you, know, you know, the projects that, that make sense as we talk with uh, the city leaders next meeting. Um, so that, that's all we have for this meeting. Seth and, and maybe Mike and Brendan, you guys hear this stuff as, as city officials, but is there something in terms of, like if, is there something of all the things Seth said, what's the thing that you think is the most important? Is it signage? Is it, is it, is it, um, uh, uh, I, you talked about the access plan. I mean, like, what's the thing that you think, you know, maybe Seth, I'll ask you like, what, what, you know, you've been here for a while. What, what do you think is the most pressing thing that hits your brain every day around, around what you just talked about? Well, I'll say this. I mean, I, I, I can work on, and already have started some of this, but just the, the thought and, and the, 
collecting of information around the street furnishings and signage and lighting. Um, that's something I'm comfortable and have done in the past and uncomfortable doing. Um, kind of on my day to day, but I, you know, as, as Mike and I have talked, and I think Brendan and, and Kim too, um, we're looking at maybe the sidewalk infill program as the potential um, from, from perception and, and from impacting the most number of individuals. We think that that, um, that program could be, um, you know, could, could have a little more value um, one, because it's, uh, I think a little, I'll, I'll call it lower hanging fruit, just because we think that, you know, it's, it's fundable. And, um, you know, some of the things we're looking at, we've, we've got very heady topics. Some of the things we're looking at are gonna take a lot of time and, and will need to be phased, but the info program is something that can affect a lot of people and, and we can do it fairly quickly. And it's kind of my opinion, you know, completing completing something that is already been started. Yeah, you know, that that's the, those, and I think uh, I think everyone on here at some point over the, our meetings has kind of chimed in on that and and things of just you know, it's one thing to start a whole new strip of sidewalks, but it's one thing of okay, here's some, here's some, let's get let's fill in this part that doesn't have them. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I, mean, I, think, think we, yeah. I think we all have kind of touched on that. Yeah. I have a uh, quick question about the ODOT Safe Routes to School funding. Is that, does that require that the infrastructure connect directly to the school? Because I've been in a bad habit of getting stuck behind the bus on Main Street, and there's a lot of kids uh, at a few apartment complexes who get on the bus, and there's no sidewalks. Um, Front of a couple of those strips right before you get to Westbrook, and it's, it, I would never have noticed it had it not been for our discussions here. But um, so I guess my question would be: Could that money be used to put a sidewalk or a bus stop or just some infrastructure there for the kids getting on the bus? I mean, I think so. Um, I, I haven't looked at it super closely i mean i just kind of read a high level summary of it but it looks like if the improvement is within two miles of the school um that it, that it could qualify for uh, for that grant eric did you talk to them about the rta thing i did uh, briefly um okay okay i missed it so <laughs> I, I would be curious if we could start stacking some money and then you know uh, i at least know from the one person on the board that I spoke to, it would require some commitment from us regarding the infrastructure and upkeep. That's the big thing, upkeep. And that's something I've ran into in personal injury claims is where a city might not, uh, they might get money for something and then think that the state of Ohio or, or the government's, the, another government entity is going to take care of it. But um, usually those situations work out where that is now city property and the responsibility of the city to maintain down the road. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. If it if it's in our right of way, generally speaking, it is our responsibility to maintain. So that's a good point. I actually I actually think that's a better idea anyway. Um, I think if um, you know, I think if it's if it's in our city, I think we should have that commitment. Um, you know. RTA is great at what they do, but they're probably not great at emptying trash cans, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, you see it up and down the bus stops, uh, right. you know, everywhere. Right. And, uh, yep. you know, I, I don't, I definitely don't want that. You know, we, we, I think it's, uh, we, we would have to plan for that. Hey, just two more things on the, the streets things. Um, it's kind of a more or less kind of questions for Seth, really. Seth Dorman, and that is that, uh, you know, when you, uh, again, low hanging fruit to me, uh, I'm not sure what legal things we need to jump through here, but lowering the speed limit seems doable pretty quickly to me. And if we would, you know, if you want to do that on Main Street, 
you know, I don't know what it is now, probably 45. If we want to make it 35, let's just say, for instance, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, I don't think we can just say, well, we're making it 35. I think it needs to be, there, there's probably going to have to be a study done on that because oh, there's a lot of people that use that, you know, thoroughfare for work, obviously. So the speed limits, I think, are doable for us. But the other thing we had mentioned the other day when we were looking at Union Road out here, I think on Main Street, another lower hanging fruit, this would this would um, entail some money, I understand, but I think um, we should look at making boulevards. I think uh, not only on Union where we talked about it, you know, if you look at Union Road in Englewood, uh, much of it's a really nice boulevard. And, you know, guess yeah. what? You know, yeah, people still probably go faster than 35, but they're not going 45 and 50. And I think that, I think that feel of a boulevard, I think people are a little bit better at going slow. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe if we, if we lowered the speed limit on Maine and actually put in some boulevards versus just that wide open racetrack feel, <laughs> You know, because I mean, that's what you get, you know, when you're driving down there. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it gets into some of those areas, people driving pretty fast. That's the way you make up time in your... Yes, it is. <laughs> that's right. So, but like I said, I don't know if those are, you know, there's, we, I mean, we'd get a ton of pushback on both of those things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, looking at our vision... You know, if we want something that people are going to actually use it as a main street versus a freeway, you know, to downtown or wherever they're going, then I think uh, we're going to have to be able to, you know, withstand some backlash on that stuff. So, well, I, I think you're spot on, Mike. I mean, if you look at the road sections that are shown in Plan Clayton, I mean, the that kind of concept is is really kind of what I think is planned or visioned for Main Street is Boulevard, again, parking out on the street, um, you know, for the term road diet. And, and that's kind of what we're talking about, but basically um, bringing everything in, you know, a little bit and making it feel smaller. And that has the effect of slowing traffic down uh, in addition to a posted speed limit. So, and, and that'll be critical. Um, for, for areas that we envision for pedestrian, not just pedestrian traffic, but people to hang out and to go to restaurants and shops and, and, yeah, and yeah. be in an area, you, you yeah. can't have a, a racetrack. Yeah, I, I, Mike, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying there. I, I think it's, um, I think it would lend itself to, I don't know what, what's the right word. I mean, more, more community feel too, you know, I mean, and I guess, I guess, you know, 35, it, it is 35 up until you get to almost Westbrook Road, if you're going north, right? Uh, it's, um, and I, I, I take uh, Westbrook to Maine every day to go to work. Because, um, yeah, because from Westbrook till, well, I'm trying to think when it switches over, because it's 45 through, most of that when you're heading north, I think it, I'm trying to even think when you get to Old Salem, I think, I believe it's still 45 uh, through that section. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think, boy, I, I'd be, I'd venture to guess that probably almost all that stretch it, it's in the city of Clayton is probably 45. The only part that might not be would be the most northern part uh, when you get around uh, Garber. And that and, but it it changes pretty quick. It, it uh, after that. Yeah. And I don't know about on the call, but I mean, I, there's probably five or six examples that we've seen where people, have, you know, communities have done this, and you know, change isn't easy. But I think if it's done for the right reasons, and people tend to tend to, you know, do it. <laughs> All right, so. On board, yeah. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, in the end, it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it doesn't affect people's, you know, their time to get to get the places really in the end, right. if you're lowering it 10 miles an hour. 
um, you know, and, and along Main Street. Yeah. Yeah, along Main Street. So, yeah. Good deal. Good. All right. Well, uh, just hey, just one, one more comment on the speed thing. And, uh, and maybe I'm showing my age. I don't know. I think that's probably part of it. But, you know, the slower um, not only does it, you get a lot of benefits from actually being slower uh, when you're driving. I mean, you get a lot less, um, you know, uh, you're, I mean, you get, you get more people that'll stop like we had talked about, but you also get much less other things like accidents, traffic tickets and things like that. And um, that's, you know, that's the part I think, you know, that part of it anyway, that we can sell on, on this, um, you know, slower is better speed kills. Yeah. I mean, it's not a old cliche, but I think, you know, from a city, um, I think we need to, you know, make sure all of our speed limits. We have other uh, streets too, Westbrook Road and Diamond Mill and some of the Sweet Potato and all these. I think the speed limit's 50 miles per hour on those. National. It, and it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's too fast. Yeah, mm -hmm. West, West, yeah. Westbrook's 40. I travel yeah, that Westbrook every, is 40, yeah. 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 I travel that every day and uh, oh. might have gotten a reminder one morning uh, a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> you put it up to a point and then it changes to 50. Right mm -hmm. after those apartments, it changes to 50. Mm -hmm. so, well, Westbrook? Yes. Mm. So, you know, but th those are the kind of things I think we can, again, if we want to, you know, if we want to put out, um, hey, you know, you're in Clayton, you know, we're, I don't want us to be a speed trap, you know, or anything like that. But, you know, when you come to Clayton, you know, you got to slow down. And it's just, I mean, that's what people say going through Oakwood. That's going to say we don't want to turn into an Oakwood. <laughs> well, I, I don't really want to be that. You know, I don't want to, I don't want our cops, you know, sitting there, you know, 24 seven giving out tickets. But I also, again, I think we would have more people, you know, slowing down and stopping at some of these businesses that hopefully will be opening up. And also, we'll get the benefit of things like less crashes, you know, hopefully. Mm -hmm. any, and maybe some other benefits. Are there any legal criteria for, I mean, like, if we go in and we want to change it to 35, are we going to get any pushback? Because, you know, it's State Route 40 and 48, and we have a lot of, um, you know, I don't know if Ohio... Um, has criteria for how you can change the speed limit, in other words. I think the city has control over that, even if it's a state route, if it's in our city limits, okay. um, I think we have control over the speeds. Okay. And, and long term, you know, there's those things like me, you know, if we're looking at doing that, say on 48, you know, there's those things like medians are things that naturally um, slow things down. I mean, it's even on the you know, if you, um, you know, there's kind of some examples there on on the what's up on the screen now, the central core plan of the of those things. You know, um, if you want to see entertainment, bring up uh, roundabouts during a city council meeting to Mr. Gorman. Uh, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, but but yeah, there is those things that you know that, that naturally slow down traffic as well. Now, obviously, it's a lot cheaper to change a street sign than it is to put in a median, but it might be something long-term that we're saying we're slowing these, some of these speeds down, but then we're also going to, you know, down the road be putting in these, these natural uh, mm -hmm. things that do it as well. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, I got to log off here for a little bit. Um, I might be able to come back on in a few minutes though. Okay. But for now yeah. I got to hop Thanks. off. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Good deal. Well, good. Thanks, Mike and, um, and Seth. Any, anything you want to add to that? Or are you, we good on that one? I think we're good. Okay. Um, I'll give a report. On, I, I, Seth, uh, Seth Palace had to teach tonight. And so he, he, um, he said he was going to be late and it, it, it might have run over a little bit. So I'll give you, uh, you heard a little bit of this the last time, but I'll, I'll just go through this kind of quickly about what Seth and I uh, think about about the uh, connected parks. Um, and I will say, uh, last time I mentioned this, but um, uh, the plan did call for connecting the existing parks 
and Seth and I weren't necessarily uh, enthralled with that idea per se, because they just didn't see, we, we like the idea of connecting them to neighborhoods and people that they're around, but they don't, the notion of connecting all of the Clayton parks didn't seem to be, um, I don't know, the right, didn't seem to, did, he and I both didn't seem to think that that was the highest and best use of, of our recommendations because they're kind of far from each other and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of connectivity naturally to them. But here's the first thing, um, um, and this is, Seth made this comment, just prioritize the current budget with, you know, trying to sit, look at the current parks and saying, hey, where, you know, where's the most impactful return on investment for the current budget? And both he and I know that the city would do that anyway. Uh, the second item we put was um, investigate the potential of Meadowbrook to be um, more than uh, to, to be a golf course and a restaurant as the city intends to keep it, which is great. Uh, but on top of that, could there be some kind of plan that would really look at all the acreage and say, yep, well, we're, it's going to be a golf course, a restaurant, but we think we could add in a couple other things, whether it's, um, I don't know, whether it's some green space that community, you know, the community could use or whether it's, maybe some walking paths, again, where people don't have, wouldn't get hit by golf ball. Um, but we think that's a good idea because it's 71 acres. And, you know, and I know this is not a new topic because this has been talked about a lot, but we, we think that it would be great if, if there could be some um, enhanced use on that property. Uh, a bigger ticket item that we talked about the last time, um, uh, Seth and Seth and I got on a call with uh, Metro Parks, their chief planner, and they're really trying to connect the dots internally in the county to the bike pass system. Um, if in the plan that they have would be to connect the regional bike, well, the wish they would have would be to connect the regional bike pass system from Shoop Mill and uh, uh, Shoop Mill Road and Riverside up through um, the Shiloh Conservation Area up into Clayton to Grossnickel. It's about an eight to $10 million project it, um, and as Seth mentioned last time, there's like a 25% um, match, right? So, so what we wrote in here is we, we think if, if, if and again, this won't happen right away, this is more of a long-term plan, but if, but if the Northern communities, Clayton, Englewood, and Union, um, and other you know, public and private sector entities uh, could kind of band together and advocate for that, then maybe the match wouldn't fall so much on one community um, and, um, uh, and, and that project could get done. Um, Seth mentioned to me that, um, you know, uh, um, Mine Valley North has done some trail building on the back end of their property. I don't know if people have seen that, but they've, they've built some trails on their property. And so, um, so, you know, for example, maybe, maybe Premier would be interested in, in supporting that from a funding standpoint as well. Uh, the next thing was we just said better access to parks. And I, I kind of stole this idea from Seth one day uh, I was talking to him. Uh, but he, we, one, one idea would be trying to figure out if, um, if there could be better access from Westbrook Road uh, into Westbrook Park. Because if you don't know where that uh, neighborhood entrance to that park is, it's kind of hard to find it. Uh, so, so if that could happen. Uh, the next idea we had was... Uh, Investigate the potential potential of Hard Scrabble Park to offer more services beyond current use. And I I probably know Meadowbrook more because I played golf there and I just I'm closer to it. But uh, the idea being, you know, could, could Hard Scrabble be uh, again keep keep some of the current facilities, but could you layer on some other additional um, uh, you know uh, athletic recreational services on top of that? And then the last two things we said was to improve the bike and pedestrian options along existing roadways. Uh, this is really what Derek and um, uh, Mindy talked about. And then the last thing was um, in support of the goal three in the plan Clayton document, identify future potential green space uh, within the city that, that would, would match up with the city's capacity to, to fund that too. So that's our report. I would ask a question maybe um, in terms of the recommendation for the Meadowbrook, um, what kind of conversations have happened in the past around that? I know there's been a lot, but ha have, have there been kind of conversations about trying to leverage more uses there? Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation about that. We've talked about 
just about every possible thing I can think of, you know, cross country, walking trails, amphitheater, restaurant, you know, there's a, a moving the police station there, moving the government center there. I mean, we, it's been completely all over the board. And I think for the most part, it comes down to two things. You know, one, obviously the money, you know, it's, it's always going to be a money issue there. But the other thing is, you know, you just really have to be conscious of what you put there because people are playing golf. And it's, um, frankly, the golfers, you know, aren't going to want a something in the middle of their golf course. But it's also becomes a danger aspect of hitting golf balls because I don't care how good of a golfer you are, you hit some errant golf shots. And, you know, all we need to do is get, you know, someone hitting the head with a golf ball and that, that'd be the end of that. But um, I think there's enough room there that, you know, we can do something, but we've just never really hit on the right things. There, there's a, there's so many different ideas. And, and I've, again, I've been right in the mix trying to, th you know, throwing out all these sometimes conflicting ideas, but uh, I think we do have potential there. Um, in my mind, it needs to be a concentrated effort, you know, for for one person to really concentrate on Meadowbrook. And it becomes a staffing issue for the city. Um, you know, we have Elaine, who's done a great job over there managing, you know, the events and all that, the activities and, and everything over there. But in my mind, for Meadowbrook to get to the next level, we have to have somebody really dedicated to that and not a secondary job. And again, it's, you know, it means hiring another person. So. I know, and, you know, that, that place, obviously, the last two years has had two major events affected with, two, you know, two years ago, <laughs> taking a direct hit from the tornado. Uh, and then last year with, with COVID. Now, coincidentally, COVID caused that place well, and it was, we were closed for about a month and a half completely. Uh, we had, I believe the most rounds of golf played there mm -hmm. in the time that the city, that it's been city of Clayton property. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, for a variety of reasons, but um, I know a big thing with that facility is, is really trying to get it, you know, uh, back in the black. Cause I think the last couple of years we've been running about 200 K uh, short on it. Uh, as far as the numbers go. And, and we were on a good path. Uh, the banquets, we were to the last for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, God, we had, I think it was pretty much every weekend, there was there was a scheduled event there. Um, and of course, then now with uh, COVID, that, you know, we had, all those have been canceled and, and everything for the most part. There's still some like the meetings uh, for, for a few things like the Rotary and, and things, but um, I know that's really a main focus and there has been investment into the facility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, it's so challenging with some other, with the layout of it um, and to, to kind of do new things that would kind of be more community oriented uh, using the facility, you know, more permanent community or community oriented. Uh, obviously we do some events there with you know the fireworks movie in the park a few other small and and some other small stuff but um yeah it's a challenge uh i, I think we're, we are blessed to have that uh since we don't have a big community space uh, around here to to do much of anything else um but yeah it's really finding uh, yeah, i know i'm kind of rambling on with that but it's like well what could be a more constant community thing to be done there besides what you'd normally have at a country club, golf and banquets. So, you know, one, one thing that mm -hmm. Brendan hit on that, um, that I kind of hit on also is, you know, the one thing you don't want to mess with is the golf course because the people, I'm not a golfer, so I, I'm, I don't really speak from, you know, very much personal experience, but people that golf at Meadowbrook really love that course. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, it's got a long history and people have golfed there for many years. And every, I mean, since I've been involved with the city, I've never heard anybody say that course is horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone says the course is fantastic. It's in great shape. 
blah, blah, blah. So again, that kind of, um, that throws up another barrier to introducing something else to come in because we don't want to mess with, you know, what is working there. The golf is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll say this. I mean, sometimes I ask crazy questions of Jack just to sort of educate myself about Clayton. And, and so one day I said, well, what, what about redevelopment? You know, what about a residential development there? Um, in, in the course of talking through that, I, I learned that it is in the Trotwood School District, which is very interesting. But, um, you, you know, I, th I think we're seeing an uptick in some community events. I don't know if you mentioned this, Brendan, but with the fireworks and, you know, some of the other mm -hmm. Uh, Easter egg hunt and, and Halloween events and things of that nature. So, um, I mean, it feels like it's becoming a community center in addition to the golf, but I, I, I have also heard that the golf is really starting to take off and, and gain traction there. So, and, and we've got our code enforcement officer, Daryl Swafford is a, a avid golfer and, and he loves it. He thinks it's one of the best courses around. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'm going to end this on, uh, you know, or, or at least throw in my last comment on this. It's, it's a negative comment, but, you know, for that reason, I, I hope everyone will keep this, you know, within this meeting because I, I just, it's been a, you know, we've had, we've had this conversation for a couple of years, but the bottom line is for, for Meadowbrook to get to the next level as far as the catering and things like brendan said it, it has done you know much much better we're getting more and more people in there but our cater our catering company and the fact that you know you this might be another and you know, like you were saying mike you know yeah you know, ideas that get thrown out but i keep hearing more and more about pickleball like it's had this huge growth like i went to florida last year and I played it in this Everybody plays in Florida. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, 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 I mean, I'm this 80, 89 year old man beat me like soundly. <laughs> right. So, but, but, um, but no, it's, uh, but, but it's funny, like it, it, it's something. So maybe I, I guess my question is, and I don't want to belabor this too long because we got some other stuff to do, but, um, but like, even, even if there was a potential use on the site that really conflicted with the golf, um, you know, I know you've been talking about, the, you know, but maybe there are some uses like that that could, could in fact be, be complimentary. I, I, I keep hearing that less people are playing tennis and a lot more people are playing that kind of sport. So, I don't know. Well, it's you know, you know, you know Dan's uh, uh, really funny. Over here where I live in Valley Brook, we have tennis courts. The, actually, we had, at one time, we had four tennis courts. So, we had two, two that were together and then on at another location here, we have two other ones. So the one, the two that we um, like kind of over closer to my house, we um, made a playground because, you know, no one was playing. We put up basketball hoops and a playground. But on the other one, last year, we had it uh, all resurfaced and repainted and everything. The tennis courts look fantastic. Well, um, I happen to be on the board of our homeowners association so we started talking about this pickleball so we painted right over the tennis courts a pickleball <laughs> court and you cannot believe how many people play i've never played it but i, I mean I, I can see it from where i live and there they gather over there and they play all the time and i mean i'm talking about probably you know 20 20 people or more over there in our little neighborhood so anyway that's a, that's a real uh that'd be an easy thing to construct and manage. You know. Yeah. And, and there's, uh, I mean, there's a potential of, of Meadowbrook at that front section, right? Where you come in, that's a little, that's away from, you know, much of the golf, but then also utilizing that at, you know, we are existing parks. Um, yeah. You know, you've got some, I mean, I know Westbrook has some tennis courts right when you pull into the parking lot, which is, you know, off of uh, Sherry Lynn. Um, and then also, uh, you know, potential of, of some new stuff at, um, uh, at, at, at Hearts Gravel mm -hmm. uh, as well, you know, of, of figuring out. And I know there are some baseball teams that they are still utilizing that. Actually, my uh, friend, the head basketball coach at the high school, Shane Kenser, he, uh, he does his son's uh, baseball teams and, and they work and they do a lot there. But, 
Yeah, and it's, it's not getting the use like it was uh, for, you know, now that Hard Scrabble is no longer an organization here. You know, maybe look at utilizing some, you know, potentially of the existing ball fields of taking away one or two if they're just not being used and, and some other and some mixed use as far as recreational. Mm -hmm. And I've heard one request from a, a village resident, um, old village resident who, who was asking for pickleball at, at hard scrabble. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hearing a lot about it as well. It sounds popular and it's, if you, I don't know anything about it, but if Mike's, you know, if Mike's saying just in, in his community, you know, people went nuts over it. You know, we put them in some city parks and it yeah, probably people, would be a positive. Do you see people younger than 60 playing? <laughs> uh, you, you know, I've never went, I've never actually went over there. I think it's mostly, I think it's mostly older people. Yeah, like I, I, I tend <laughs> to find that in Florida. We have a place in Florida and, you know, all the people that play there are, you know, kind of like 60 and above. I mean, yeah. I, but I'm, I'm, guess, I'm like, guessing that's the demographic over here too. Okay. Uh, we have a, we have a pretty good little, uh, we have a big, uh, a mix of people here, different ages and everything. But I'd say, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm definitely not the oldest one in my neighborhood. There's a, you know, there's a, it's, there's a pretty large number of people, you know, 60 and above. My guess is that's who's over there. So. Good. All right, hey Seth, do you want to go to the next? Uh, can you can you uh, pull up the agenda again? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so really, would just be, um, and I know it's eight thirty-eight. We've had quite a discussion on on our subcommittees. Uh, again, preliminary discussion on project ranking. Um, we've got a. Um, We've got about six items that we've put into the spreadsheet for kind of scoring categories, projected cost, accessibility, in terms of available land, um, benefit to the largest number of residents, perceived impact to the community, availability of outside funding sources, and urgency and time to complete. Um, I think that's one that Mindy and, and Derek added. Thank you for that. Does anyone have any others that, that we might add prior to? So we're gonna have the leadership roundtable discussion at the next meeting. Um, meeting five then will be our scoring meeting uh, with the idea of maybe meeting six being kind of putting together the plan and, and maybe report to city council um, or at least talking through that. Um, do, do you all who are, who are still on the meeting, do you have any other ideas for scoring categories that would make sense? I've got one, um, I, and I believe, I just want to make sure that um, this idea is here. And I think probably we're thinking of the same thing when you say perceived impact to the community. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking, um, let me see, I don't even know if I can verbalize this. I'm kind of thinking uh, value as far as, um, you know, when we were talking about the, um, in a couple, actually in a couple conversations since that Redwood um, decision, you know, I'd asked Jack, you know, well, how much, how much money do you think it costs to develop, to build that development? And I think those are I think those are interesting things to know because basically the answer to that one's probably about somewhere around seventeen million dollars. Okay, so to me, you know, that's a that's a value. Is that what we mean by impact to the community? Would that be considered that, or is that something different? It it probably more. Um... I mean, I think it's maybe a little more tied to benefit to the largest number of residents. So, I mean, you might have a project that isn't the most expensive, um, isn't the most glamorous, but yet 
the perception from the community is that we've done a really great thing. Um, you know, I mean, and I, and I kind of harken back to the sidewalk infill program. I mean, some of those sections are small, but they're critical linkages that if we were to put it in, um, you know, maybe, it, maybe it, like, like you, you were talking about Mike on, and, and you too, Brendan on, on union, you know, getting folks from the condos or the flats to be able to walk down to uh, Casey's or, or something like that. I mean, um, that would be perceived as a fairly large impact mm -hmm. to, to, a, to a, quite a number of people. So that, I, I think that's what I mean by that. Um, okay. mm -hmm. That's how I took it. You know, reading that wasn't as much of a, uh, you know, income perceived impact because I, I think w everything we're doing here, um, I, I, that's kind of, you can say, is a long-term goal of making a better developed uh, city that it will eventually bring in more of these things. But, you know, you look at kind of what we're doing here, and I know we kind of got, you know, a little bit off of, uh, on another discussion as far as when we were discussing about Main Street of, um, of things you know, as far as businesses and, and develop and development and things like that. But I think with what, what we're do, our discussion here with a lot of this is, okay, we put in this infrastructure, these great little things, walkability uh, and, and things. It's going to make more people, uh, you know, look at, at coming here and developing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm good with that. I think it might, I kind of like the, um, idea of adding some of that language in and may, maybe we can call it um, like an actual value added you know and we can include things like what would it do to the tax base how much does it cost to actually develop that land you know things like that you know and may, maybe that could be a, a, another factor we uh, judge these projects off of um, a, a, another potential ranking uh, metric I was thinking of way back in the beginning of our conversation. Um, most of these projects are cumulative. You know, if, if we connect the sidewalk and um, work on maybe acquire some property, uh, then, then another, we can maybe check another thing off the list or, or may, maybe the next business will be uh, property we bought by the next business owner, you know, so maybe a, uh, 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 a synergy uh, factor or a cumulative factor might be something else we can um, add into how we rank the projects. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Another metric. I hi, this is Seth Paulus. Um, another thing I think we might want to consider is um, long-term investment from outside businesses, right? And the movement that seems to be happening in small towns like Clayton Inglewood, and I'm thinking of my old home, Perrysburg, where I still work closely with that mayor, is diversity and equity. Um, diversity and equity in terms of not just race, religion, gender, and all the usual suspects, but we talk about pickleball. And there's an equity component to that, which is catering towards a certain population. Mm -hmm. I think somebody joked, but maybe not joking, over the age of 60. And, you know, putting something like that at a golf course, for example, has merit. And you mentioned it's in the school district of Trotwood. So hopefully you kind of see where I'm going with this. So I definitely think we need to factor in diversity and equity with these initiatives to make it a more of a level playing field, socioeconomically, as well as the usual suspects when we talk about diversity and equity. Yeah, I, I agree also. I agree with that, Seth. So. Yep, yep. Let me ask you this, the availability of outside funding sources. Um, uh, I'm just going to play devil's advocate on that one. Uh, Seth Dorman, mm -hmm. is that, is that a little over confusing since I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I, maybe to your point, um, we're not going to know that, I guess. Um, mm, you know, there, there we, can, are, we can, we can know that. Yeah, so I'm working, with the, I'm working with the Shared Resource Center. Um, that's a school, that's a third-party school um, initiative that 
a uh, guy named Dan's getting up and running, Centerville, Valley View, formerly Jeffersonville. And they're doing climate surveys all over the cities to find out about diversity and equity and why certain outside funding sources, as Dan put it, are shunning certain cities. Clay Minglewood pops up as not being very, um, what's the word? Um, I want to say diverse, but we're definitely diverse, but maybe we don't broadcast it like we should. I'm trying to be careful here. So I think there's outside funding opportunities, Dan, that are definitely available that we could explore if we had a, a marketing campaign of some sort. It doesn't have to be explicit that suggests that we're open for business to everybody, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you see from your experience where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I, um, it, and when you say it that way, it makes complete sense. Uh, I guess I was thinking about it like, oh my gosh, do we have to <laughs> prioritize? Do we have to understand if those sources of funding exist before we make it a priority? But the way you said it is perfect. So let's keep it. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Seth, uh, do you, th so can you lay out, when uh, let me ask you take us through so 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 we'll ha all have the spreadsheet uh, maybe we'll have a chance to clean up the language a little bit on that spreadsheet um i know i, I wouldn't mind doing that again just looking at the language one more time mm -hmm. on stuff but like so we would get that back out to everyone and can you develop some kind of can you develop some kind of visual way for us to match up these um criteria with can you take a stab at that, giving us something to work from? In terms of adding the additional scoring categories? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, so, yeah. I mean, on this spreadsheet, I have kind of five, but room for 10 categories. And I've just suggested kind of a points one to five. Um, so I can add those additional things in. And then um, if you want to take a, a shot at, sort of tweaking things. I'll, I'll send the spreadsheet out to everybody. Um, if you want to tweak the language a little bit, um, possibly put a final coat of polish on the list of projects in your area. I mean, we've talked, to, we've talked about those a lot. So the, I think the list of projects is pretty good at this point. But what I want to do is have um, the spreadsheet in good shape by the 24th so that I can send it to the leadership group that's going to meet with us in, in April so that they can begin to think about the projects and costs and, and kind of what will be involved in those. And so that when we get to the meeting on uh, April 7th, and, and I should, I should mention that that's the first Wednesday of April. I wanted to do it on the 14th, but um, Randy Sanders will be out of the country. And so uh, I'd like to kind of talk about that with everybody right now can we all meet on the first Wednesday of April? Does that, does that work for everybody? Uh, just speaking for me, it's good for me. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good for me. Okay. It's, it's good for me, except if my son, they have their baby. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's, they're due right around then. So okay. it might maybe come early, but then, I have the responsibility of the other two kids Excellent. because nobody can go to the hospital. So okay. um, sure. I'm thinking I'll be okay and um, we'll see. <laughs> well, maybe in the interest of Clayton, the baby will come late. Yeah, I think the baby, I, I honestly think third baby is going to come early. So <laughs> probably so. I'm thinking the, you know, the end of March is probably closer. So yeah, I think you, we'll be okay. But you might be there either way, right? Uh, okay. All righty. Uh, Derek, um, Seth Palace, you guys good? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, good for me too. Okay. Great. So we'll plan on April 7th for the leadership roundtable discussion. Um, I don't think that we need, unless you want to, I don't think we need to have our subcommittee meetings this month. So maybe take a little break from that. Um, if you wanna talk on the phone or via email, kind of um, tweak things on, on your list or and or the scoring categories. Uh, if you can get kind of your comments back to me, um, 
by the 24th and I'll get a finalized list to the leadership group that'll be meeting with us. Does that sound good for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, that, that's all I have for, for tonight. Hey, uh, so I know we've, I don't, I don't want to keep everybody, but I know we've got maybe a few more minutes before we knock off, but I am, I, I had Seth send this article around this morning. I, mm -hmm. I ran across this article mm -hmm. in, uh, Politi Politico magazine yesterday and and it's just it, I think it relates to what we're talking about here and I just we don't I just wanted to offer this up as maybe something we want to consider putting in the final report or making some kind of a statement but I don't want to speak for everybody the article really if you didn't get a chance to read it if, if you do the article really talks about the fact that we we just simply don't have enough housing right and um and, and I mean I know Kim is a realtor and Mike is a realtor. We asked him at the first meeting we had, hey, how's it going? And they're like, man, you know, houses are on the market for three days and then it's gone. Um, this article really framed that, you know, in, in many ways people think, well, that's great. Houses are selling, right? Um, but the article framed this as a potential worry in, in a couple ways. One is that um, it's really choking out, you know, first time home buyers because, you know, when you have less, supply on the market, um, prices go up and up and up. And it means, uh, it means less opportunities for people to buy. And I, you know, it, it, it is, and I, it, to kind of point to what Seth Powell just said too, um, it, in my opinion, um, my opinion, one of our, uh, my personal opinion, not the committee's opinion, which should be, look, we ought to, we ought to try to encourage more housing development in the city. And, and we ought to try to, we had to try to encourage more different kinds of housing. Um, uh, for many years, our country has really kind of, um, you know, doubled down on single family residences, which is great. I mean, um, but, but my two daughters don't necessarily, my two daughters are in their twenties and I don't think they, I mean, I, I think they're, when they look at a place to live, they're, they're, um, I think they're open to more different options. And, I don't know. I just wanted to raise that issue because I think I think if 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 the plan really is is also about um, if the community wants to grow and the community you know people people get frustrated about paying for the cost of government and one way in my opinion to broad you know one day to help that is to broaden the tax base um, I, I think that's part of what our what our goal is here and I guess I just would offer that up that it you know that that um, th that this committee, uh, or that I think, uh, that, that, that we ought to, we ought to say, you know, we need more places for people to live. And it's not just a Clayton issue. It's a, it's a national issue. Um, and we ought to, we ought to try to push, um, you know, as many quality, good places to live, uh, uh different models of kind of housing as possible, as long as it meets, you know, decent. Standards. Anyway, I, I just wanted to throw that issue up. So. Well, Dan, I don't think you're going to get any argument from Seth, myself, or Brendan. I don't. I can't speak for anyone else. You know, I, I was. I was about to start. I was about to start clapping. Especially. <laughs> I think we're pretty much months, on that so. same page, yeah. and uh, that is our goal, mm -hmm. also. Yeah. And I know it's yeah. not easy. No, I, I know. It's, I mean, Brendan, I, I know it's not easy either. I mean, because it's. And um, but can I just? And I'll shut up after they say this. But like, I was thinking about this tonight before we got the call. No, no, I, I was thinking sometimes, like, like you know, like if, if, if the discussion has started, like, look, we all, whatever ends up happening in Clayton or anywhere, we want to make sure it's quality and it's places that people, that add value to the community. But, hey, here's why we're doing it. We're doing it because in order to broaden the tax base, it's going to mean that we all, if, if we can find new ways to get new investment with housing, we're going to broad, broaden the tax base. And it's going to take the foot off the neck of uh, it's going to mean more people can join in a community mm -hmm. and pay. Anyway, that's anyway. Anyway. Oh, that was great. Oh, that was great. Yep. And I think it'll have the added benefit of driving commercial and industrial development, which, um, you know, is what, what the community said they wanted in as part of Clan Clayton. Uh, if you look at uh, kind of the stakeholder surveys and, and things of that nature. So, um, it, it, it all ties together. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Well, 
you know, we have time on that. But and, and again, I don't want to be the only voice on that. But but if but if there if there's a place in this plan that, that we could appropriately advocate for that, you know, pe the committee would have to look at it and, and decide whether the flavor was right at the end. But um, anyway, <clears throat> good. good. Well, it's kind of uh, and put putting an overall purpose of, of what all this kind of ties into. Um, and obviously, you know, you have the goals and everything, but uh, breaking it down, but kind of in the end, if we were to kind of do, uh, you know, missions, you know, kind of like a mission statement into that of what, what does this all tie into? And I think that would be a very much part of it of, uh, you know, growing this community into, you know, what it currently has and, and growing within that, but also growing into to new things that's, that's diverse in a lot of ways. Yeah. And to your point, Brendan, I had suggested to, to Dan that, um, maybe he'd take a stab at writing it, the executive summary for the implementation committees mm -hmm. with the council. And that might be a perfect place to kind of bring that up in terms of yeah. the goals and objectives mm -hmm. of Plan Clayton, but, you know, our committee as well to, yeah. to, to help facilitate some of that development and, and connectivity to, to, to community. So. Great. <clears throat> yeah. All right, so when's the next meeting again, Seth? It's gonna be April 7th at 7 okay. p.m. Um, that will be the leadership roundtable discussion. Um, I don't, I, I'm not calling for subcommittee meetings. If you wanna meet, that's fine, just let me know. But uh, otherwise, I think if phone conversations and emails back and forth, just to kind of tweak out the, the spreadsheet. I'd like everything, all your comments and notes back to me by the 24th of March, if, if, um, if that works for your your subcommittee. Gotcha. And, and, and I don't know, I don't know how comfortable people are, but would people be open to the idea of that meeting being at the city building if possible, or, or is it too early? Is it, is it too early for that? Well, so here, the, the, the only issue we have with that is um, with, with the government, the governor's orders for COVID and things, I think we're allowed to have a max of 10 people and that would put us over because we've got seven or eight okay. in our group. Um, Barb makes nine and, and she's our secretary, so I'd want her to be there. But, uh, and then with all the others from the city, we'd be over 10, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Well, good. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for, um, thanks for the energy tonight. It's a good meeting and, um, we will, yep. uh, we'll talk on April 7th. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Good job. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Night, guys. Night. Night.